are beginning an informal section of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for which we do not need a quorum. Uh, and that's a good thing because we do not have a quorum. So uh, we uh, this portion of the presentation, we're going to uh, talk about infrastructure related matters with NEST, TVA and uh, uh, so we have representatives at the table and we're going to start, we're going to allow a maximum of a half hour for this. And uh, we're going to start with a brief presentation that will last no longer than 10 minutes. And then we will open up the floor for questions and answers because I do know that uh, number of council members have spoken about getting NES and TVA before us so they could talk about some of the recent issues we experienced in the city. So without further ado, let me, Antonio, you want to introduce everybody for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Thank you, Chairman Foley, for inviting NES and TV, TVA here tonight. And, and those microphones you. work, so make sure to pull them up so we can hear you. Even though you got a loud voice, Antonio. I, I have a loud voice, I think. Good evening, every, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chairman Foley and the committee for having us here tonight. And thank you, council members. I know this is the last night in town, and so thank you all for your service uh, over this time. Term. Um, today, I have on my uh, right here, Ernie Peterson from TVA, who's going to talk about TVA's response during the uh, winter storm Elliot. And to my left, I have my colleagues from NES, Jack Baxter, who is our vice president of operations, who handles our system control. You, can also, you all have seen him on the news several times after our um, outages and talking about you know, our responses to those outages. And NES is um, vice, president of, vice president and general counsel, Laura Smith, who is a longtime um, council liaison for this body. And without further, further ado, I'll turn it over to Ernie to talk about TVA's response to the storm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, when we speak, we don't generally draw a crowd, so, so that's okay. <laughs> but, um, so real quick, I just wanna give uh, some of the basics uh, around the Winter Storm Elliott events. Certainly a privilege, I consider it a privilege to be here before the council to talk about this. Also wanna publicly think, thank uh, National Electric System, NES, uh, for being great partners uh, through through all of the, the tough days when it's there to serve and, and those other days as well. Uh, they're great partners to have with us. As you may know, TVA uh, does the generation piece. We, we've got big spinning machines that generates the electricity and then we've got the transmission system that gets it to the different regions of the valley. And then it's our local power companies, in this case, NES, that that does the distribution piece. I'd say that may be the harder part of getting power to folks because they take it from those general locations and get it out to each and every home, business, and industry uh, throughout the service area. And uh, so, uh, so that's kind of the, the setup, the generation, transmission, and then the distribution of the electric power. Talk a little about Winter Storm Elliot, December 23rd and 24th. Um, we agree that the effects of Winter Storm Elliot on the TVA power system uh, was unsatisfactory, even unacceptable. Uh, we're going to work on that, but uh, give you a little background there. You know, if, if you've met any of our employees that work maybe at Cumberland Fossil Plant, not too far from here, or Gallatin Fossil Plant, even closer, uh, if you know our employees, you know it wasn't from lack of effort to get that power out to the areas that so needed it during that uh, very cold spell. But the wind, and the rain and the temperatures uh, set up a situation that exceeded the design of our equipment effectively. We've been operating a lot of that equipment for over 50 years and never had that freeze like it did uh, on that night. Uh, we had some sensors that froze on different equipment and, uh, and that was the, the, the root cause, if you will, of the start of the situation. We lost our largest unit on the system that early morning, 
of the 23rd, uh, but that's okay. We, we operate the system every day, assuming that the next minute we're gonna lose our largest generating unit. That's just how we operate. Assume that's gonna happen, hope that it doesn't, but assume that it does. So uh, that we lost the first unit and uh, that's okay. We, we know how to handle that. Uh, about less than two hours later, we lost the next largest unit on the system. Both of those uh, because of frozen sensor lines that had never froze in the past. And, um, and so that was the largest unit, the second largest unit, and then uh, a few of our other smaller units tripped as well. But that's okay. We've got a plan for that too. We uh, we're connected with every other utility around uh, generate generation utility, and uh, so we when they have trouble, we're able to support them. When they have trouble, they support us. Vice versa. So. Um, we were lean at that point it was okay we could lean on the market if you will to pick up uh, and fill the gap on some of that transmission that worked for a while but eventually they got in the same position we were uh, our neighbors lost considerable generation in the storm the load was higher than it had ever been and they could not deliver power to us any any longer. So at that point, we go into our emergency operation uh, plan. That's a plan that we that we practice every year with our partners, and uh, and again, preparing for the worst, hoping for the best kind of thing. But uh, we work through that plan uh, once it got to that spot. It's got six steps in the plan. We got to the fifth step. We call step 50. First time in 90 years of our existence that we had ever gotten that deep in our plan to a step 50. At that point, uh, to protect the system and a, and a more complete comp or a collapse of the system, we had to shed load. At that point, we contact our partners to exercise on this plan that we have practiced many times, but never had to actually implement. And uh, at that point, our, our customers were doing, uh, were managing their load. Most of them doing the managed rolling uh, curtailments uh, is what you saw here. So um, since that time, uh, and, and it worked. I mean, it, it worked amazingly well. The, the emergency plan did what it was supposed to. It protected the system to get us through till we could get things back uh, matched up, load and and generation. And uh, at that point, we were uh, that that happened those two days in a row. Uh, but then we were okay. Lots to learn from that. Uh, again, first time we had experienced just that. Uh, there were. We've already made 250, more than 250 uh, uh, different uh, improvements, if you will, uh, to our generating plants to, to prevent some of the freezing. Uh, what had worked in the past did not, and we believe it had a, had a lot to do with the wind associated with the cold. What had worked with just just the cold, we had operated in colder temperatures even, and uh, not had this problem. So, uh, so we believe it was the wind and the temperature together, along with some of the freezing rain. Anyway, we've, we've learned a lot from that uh, and I believe in, in a lot better shape because of it. I will add one more thing before I turn it over to Jack. Since that time, since this past December, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we were able to bring 750 megawatts of generation onto the system that, wa that wasn't available. It, it, it didn't exist uh, back in December. So we've added some generation uh, at uh, North Alabama, all, the, all this is tied together through the grid. We've also got another 750 megawatts that'll be online by the end of this calendar year that we'll be able to support that, uh, that's new to the system. And we've got 500 megawatts that'll be on uh, before next summer. So we've got some additional generation coming online to help along with the improvements that we made to our existing plants. We've also got 
2,400 megawatts of solar uh, projects in the works. Uh, we've got contracts in place for that, and that will certainly uh, add some support as well. <clears throat> So, same storm happens again uh, today. I, I feel we're much better prepared, both with the improvements that we've made on the existing generation, along with the additional generation that's come online. And with that, let me turn it over to Jack. Well, Jack, he's giving you about one minute. So you've got one minute left uh, before we turn it over to questions. Great. Just, just real, I'll just be very brief about our our plans at Nashville Electric Service as we went into that evening. Uh, we constantly look at the weather forecast and decide, uh, try to, ahead of time as much as we can to decide how we're going to uh, attack and what our plans are. And with the extreme cold weather's weather coming, uh, we had scheduled crews uh, to be in that evening or uh, all the 22nd about seven o'clock we knew that that's when the winds were predicted to get here and the temperatures would begin falling so particularly when it's extreme cold single digits uh, we we have extra we always have crews 24 hours a day seven days a week but we bring additional crews as we're anticipating inclement weather so, and particularly with this being over the Christmas weekend, so we could go ahead and schedule our crews. They would know who needed to be there. So we had those crews available. The winds got here about seven or eight o'clock, just as predicted. Overnight, we had about 5,000 customers out at the maximum, just a typical high wind storm for us. Uh, by the next morning, we were down to uh, about 1,800 customers out, and we had our crews working. Uh, we got the call from TVA. Uh, it was a surprising call, uh, one we were not expecting, uh, to, that we needed to curtail and drop 5% of our load. As Ernie mentioned, we have a plan in place uh, to do that when called upon. We are uh, TVA's largest single uh, local power company, so it's important that we can deliver uh, those types of reductions when when we are asked. We op we had we implemented our plan; it worked as we expected. Uh, so we did about two hours of rotating blackouts. Uh, in that time, we had some equipment failures that we dealt with. In in the meantime, that were NES issues. Uh, the next morning. Uh, again, we TVA thought they were going to be okay. Uh, some conditions changed outside the valley with some of the power they were purchasing. This time we were called to do a 10% reduction. Again, within minutes of receiving that call, NES system operators were able to deliver that 10% reduction. And that lasted, the 10% reduction lasted for about four and a half hours. So we rotated through our uh, groups multiple times. Uh, and then we had a 5% reduction for an additional hour. So again, we, we studied the event. Uh, there were a lot of things that w uh, we had not thought of till you actually do one of these events. And, you know, we're implementing some of those uh, improvements a as we speak. So okay. I'll, I'll thank you for, a little over thank a you for that. I think it was a lot over a minute, but I was very gracious. Okay. To you. Thank you. So, uh, um, anyway, we can open this up for questions now. We got about 15 minutes before we really need to move on to the regular meeting. Uh, Vice Chair Nash. Thank you, Chairman Pulley. Uh, I hope I'm not getting too deep in the weeds, but I'm kind of curious about sensors on what kind of equipment were freezing that caused those failures. And what have we done to protect those sensors? Yes, sir. So uh, the, the two biggest units were uh, coal units uh, in Cumberland. Uh, since that time, we have... We, we had insulation around those sensors. They're at the very top of the boiler. This boiler is designed to be open air boiler, which is uh, which is excellent during the winter or during the summer when you're trying to get the heat out. Uh, but uh, but it was designed for winter operation as well. But now we have a a much improved insulation system that the wind can't penetrate. Before, it was just insulation managing temperature, if you know what I mean. This is now temperature and wind, and we feel a lot better about that. Thank you. I have one more. Um, I think the biggest issue, if memory serves right, was uh, NES. Uh, the substation broke down in Antioch. 
Was that because when you shut down the power there, it became more vulnerable or what happened uh, in that uh, situation? So this was kind of a, a Murphy's Law thing, you know, every, anything that can go wrong will. <laughs> What we had at the Cane Ridge substation is we had a component failure in one of our uh, communication cabinets that uh, created a, uh, a fire for us. So it really had nothing to do with the rolling blackouts. This was a component failure. Uh, again, had it not been so, you know, we had not had the negative temperatures, we we would have had the ability to transfer that load out faster uh, than what we did. We have a reluctance. Uh, we try not to operate equipment as little as possible when we're in around zero degrees because sometimes that you have other component failures and then you increase your, your problems. So we were able to, 21,000 customers are fed from the Cane Ridge substation. We actually had a fire in our control building. Uh, Metro Fire Department came out. We evacuated the, the smoke out of the building, evaluated what our problems were. We were able to, within a couple of hours, pick up about 14,000 of those customers uh, with some automated type equipment. Uh, the other 7,000, we were debating about what to do. Once we could get into the control building and evaluate the situation, we believed that we could make temporary repairs and that was gonna be the quickest, uh, safest thing to do. Normally, those repairs should have been able to have been made in a couple of hours. Uh, we added a little bit of time. We were thinking we were gonna get power back on by 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, but there's a lot of intricate wiring that had to be done uh, and the building was open. We had fans blowing so that it would keep the, uh, the, the smell from the burnt insulation out. And it was also, we had temporary lighting. Uh, it took those electricians a lot longer to make those repairs, but we were confident uh, we had a plan and we ended up bringing those customers back on about eight o'clock that evening. So those customers were out for, for about 11 hours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let's hope we don't have any more uh, acts of God <laughs> anytime soon. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any other questions? <laughs> Councilmember Bradford? I've got to find you. Here you are. Thank you. Um, two questions. First one's for T uh, TVA, the other one's for NES. First one, you mentioned some of the um, extra power that's coming onto the system. And then you spe uh, specifically stated that's 2,400 to be solar. So of the other, is that all traditional coal fire power or is it other sources like nuclear or geothermal, et cetera? Right, of the new load that I mentioned, that is all natural gas fired, uh, except for the 2,400 megawatts of solar. Thank you, and for NES, so over the last few years, it could be a day just like today and I, see reports from constituents about power going out, or it could just be a light breeze and power goes out. What is NES doing to upgrade and ensure that our neighborhoods are not losing power, especially now, especially in the summer when we're experiencing these 90 plus degree days? Well, we're do, we do a variety of things. We, we have an asset management program and we're doing, uh, working that to make improvements to aging infrastructure. We do vegetation management. Uh, the reasons for the outages, they, they are from a variety of reasons. Um, again, from some of them are vegetation, some of them are component failure. Some, we have a, a fair number of vehicle accidents on the system as well. Um, and with all the construction, uh, we we have, uh, I know you find this hard to believe, but we, we have people with uh, dump truck beds up that drive through power lines. Uh, uh, so it, it's a variety of reasons. But again, we, we have a reliability management group. There's lots of things that we do to try to analyze what's causing our outages and to target uh, what we're doing to try to prevent those. Well, as looking into ways to prevent some of those situations you just described, are you looking at for future development and retroactively putting utilities underground so that people are not driving into them or carelessly driving their dump trucks through them? Certainly for future developments, uh, we're trying to get as much underground as possible. Uh, as far as going back retrofitting, that there, there are challenges with that, uh, with the expense. Uh, 
and with uh, again we've looked at some cost of that uh, it's it's several billions of dollars to the to NES to underground the system and then there's also the expense to the customer because if you are currently served from an overhead system and we convert your neighborhood to underground uh, your electric entrances are going to have to be converted so the power to your home and those those costs are bared by the customer and so it, it's quite an expensive and then also it's, it's easier to underground when it's new uh, because everybody's putting stuff in so again that that is the method that we're we we push going forward uh, as you go back after the fact uh, we've got to get the power lines in underneath the water system the gas system uh, and then there's no guarantee that uh, the comm systems are going to follow us underground. So it's going back after the fact. It presents uh, a, a great deal of challenge. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Bradford. Uh, Councilmember Syracuse. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me, even though I'm not in the committee. Uh, thank you all for being here. Just curious about the, the status of updating the efficacy of the online outage map. Uh, what could, have you got anything more? It's, it, it doesn't, well, I know you, you all do great work. I'll start with that. Um, we get c consistent complaints about the map not being updated uh, uh, soon enough, not recognizing the number of outages, uh, uh, whether the status of uh, res responding to it. Um, it doesn't seem as uh, up to date by, <laughs> by, uh, uh, by the moment, uh, if possible, which I, I understand the tech issues there, but my understanding was that you are always working to try to increase the effectiveness of up-to-date minute uh, statuses. Yeah, okay, that, that is correct. So we, uh, we are always looking at how to make improvements. We did have a situation in a storm recently where there was uh, a kind of a, a, a community, sort of some, IT systems communicating with each other that failed. And so the outage map was actually several hours out of date. And so we are looking at those problems and we're, we're trying to, um, uh, where we can eliminate handshakes between computer systems. Uh, that's something that we're, we're trying to do on a regular basis with a lot of systems uh, to try to make that occur but again we do take feedback on the outage map and try to make improvements to that uh, it's probably been a couple years ago we made some significant changes to the outage map but again we we take feedback from our surveys and from our customers and turn that over to our IT group to look at ways to improve and we look at a lot of other utilities maps uh, we see features that we have in those um, so we're that is something that is ongoing. I, I do appreciate it and just encourage um, the continued investment in, in, in that. If there's one complaint that I think we get most consistently is that there, the, the public is not aware of the status of their particular outage or whatnot. I know you have the uh, tech system and all that kind of thing, but that map is used so much and people d are dependent on that so much. So the, the, the more that you can make that uh, uh, up to date, um, I know it's dependent on somebody actually reporting it as well. Uh, um, and I think that's, especially with social media, people uh, tell everybody, uh, tell their neighbors, report it, report it, report it, and then they look at the map and they say, well, 400 people just reported it, but it only shows 35, things like that. So um, I think that's the biggest bang for your buck in customer service. So thank you so much. Point well taken. Thank you, Council Member Syracuse. We uh, have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, Council Member Evans. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. I've got two quick questions. The first question um, is around, kind of it ties in together. So the growth that we're seeing in Davidson County, and of course the Antioch community was the biggest hit in December, you know, with the issues that they had down there. And I think one of the things that residents want to see is they want kind of some validation or reassurance that your growth is matching our growth as a city. And so uh, during the, um, the after effect of the tornado was my community wanting to understand kind of what the trajectory was for NES in our area. Um, and so I guess, can you speak to like how you are, how you are growing along with the growth of Davidson County, the increase in development and, and that kind of thing? You can start now. Okay. 
Yeah, let me let me start with the generation and the uh, transmission side of things. And so that, that 750 megawatt plant uh, that I mentioned earlier, I have to look at my notes here to get, be sure I get my decimal or my comma right. 370,000 homes for that one, it, that one plant would serve 370,000 homes. And, and of course that was just one of several that I mentioned. So we're working hard to keep up with the growth. There is more, I must say, there is more growth coming out of COVID than we were ready for. But we are working really hard trying to catch up there, and I, I think we're getting a good start on it, bringing those plants online in the next 12 months. So I'll just hit high level here. At, at NES, we we have a we do a 20-year plan, and we update that plan annually. So we we really focus on the 20-year plan, five-year plan, and two-year plan. So uh, again, the two-year plan is really because our our budgets are two-year cycles. So we're we have two years worth of construction, growth, uh, maintenance, new business. In our, in our budget, we look at the five-year plan. And so, again, we look at these uh, every 10 to 15 years, we, we start from scratch. We do a brand new one. And then we, renew, we look at that every year because you make, uh, we use various forecasting models for load forecasting. Um, it includes a lot of just regular measurements of load growth, but also where are uh, building permits going, all of that feeds into our models. And so you make assumptions. And so you look at it every year to determine, uh, okay, we made this assumption. This is what we thought it would look like this year. What, how is it off? And we, we adjust those models ongoing. Thank you for that. That is answering that question for sure for me. And then the other question that I had was kind of tied to that growth. I've had, and Antonio and I have had exchanges about this, but I've had a developer in my area who has had particular challenges with procurement um, of equipment and, and getting um, new houses online. And that he's been working with it uh, with somebody at NES, and I think it's getting a little bit better. But kind of to that point is the downstream impact those procurement issues have, in particular on smaller builders um, who are, and also residents who are trying to leave apartments or other rental situations to move into new homes. And so how are you addressing the procurement issues um, that NES has had? As best we can. Uh, Supply chain has been a huge problem for us. Uh, equipment like distribution transformers, uh, historically, uh, delivery on those were 24 to 30 weeks, so about a half a year. Today, those delivery times, we have seen those extend out over two years. Um, and it's not just transformers, it's it's a lot of different equipment. And even our builders, we're in our discussions with them, they are having problems purchasing uh, switch gear where they receive the power from us. Uh, we've done a variety of things. Uh, we, we've placed tons of orders. We've tried to get creative in the way we, we, we structure our bids um, tr to get delivery. Uh, we're working closely with those vendors. They are having problems uh, obtaining uh, what's called core steel is what's used in transformers. Uh, so we're, we're doing all sorts of things. We're working very closely with our vendors, our vendors, our customers, to make sure we understand exactly what their needs are. I've uh, got some good examples of how we've done that. I want to go into those here. Uh, and then also from a legislative standpoint, we're, we're trying to be advocates for manufacturers uh, at the federal level uh, to, to lighten uh, energy efficiency regulations. Uh, there are people that could be providing us uh, a lower quality core steel uh, to increase transformer manufacturing, uh, but they're not going to be able to hit um, some of the efficiency targets that are mandated. So we're working at all levels. Uh, uh, on that. Uh, I'm glad to hear you say that 
some of your constituents see it getting some better. Uh, we are seeing that uh, some of our transformer manufacturers and other equipment manufacturers are more I won't say they're meeting their delivery dates, but they're they're more closely meeting those and actually giving us uh, times uh, that we have confidence in. Uh, we're not sure we're out of the, out of the woods yet, but uh, we have seen some some moderate improvement in recent weeks. We've got uh, we're about out of time here, but we have Councilmember Swope and Councilmember Hurt had their hand raised. So if we could uh, just have those two briefly ask questions and we need to wrap it up. Uh, Councilmember Swope, go ahead. You want your microphone? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so in, in the interest of time and, and the interest that my question for TVA is a little bit more involved than a two minute response. So it lets you and I talk before you leave. All right. Uh, Everybody in NES, from Teresa on down, you guys are doing an amazing job. Um, I don't care how everybody wants to whine and complain. Um, I know you guys are out there in the absolute worst possible uh, weather situations in brutal, brutal environments, uh, getting all of our power back on. So you have my sincerest thanks. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Swope. Councilmember Hurt, we're doing our greatest Thelma Harper with that lovely hat. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My question is, how do you prioritize what it is that you do and where you do it? And I also wonder if you have any um, way that you go around to the residents to see where there are low power lines because... I know that in some areas, the power lines are very, very low, and even some regular cars and trucks could be very, very dangerous. And I, I'm just wondering if there's any way that you all track that or, or investigate it on a regular basis. Okay, just uh, I'll hit real quick. On, on restoration, uh, we always, we target uh, the largest customers first. We try to, uh, so that... Um, uh, most effective use of our resources uh, to get the lo Define large customers. Uh, largest number of customers. Uh, so if, if I have an entire substation out, uh, again, where I've got 20,000 customers out, that's going to be where we start. Uh, our circuits where we've got, six, you know, two to three, 4,000 customers out. So we, we look at how many customers are associated with the outages. We work our way down. There are some exceptions there. Uh, if hospitals, uh, other critical infrastructure, those get in there. So there's a, there's a process that we work down. As far as reporting low lines, uh, during storms, we have a dedicated group of folks that go out and look for those things. Uh, anytime anybody calls in, uh, we go check those. I will tell you this. When people report down power lines during storms, probably two-thirds of those are actually communication cables. Uh, most people can't tell the difference. Uh, and it's good that you report them as power because it's, that's the safer thing to do. Uh, when we get, when people, you can call in any time where you believe there's a low line. Customer service will create an order for us to go out and check that. Uh, we will check it. If it's communication, uh, we will notify. Of course, those lines are allowed to be lower, uh, but we will notify uh, the communication companies, but then at that point, it's their responsibility to do something about it. If it's NES lines that are low, uh, we do address those immediately. Now, which one of you are from TVA? Um, because I'm originally from the Walker Homes in Memphis, Tennessee, oh, yeah. and that's where the TVA station is over there by Fuller Park. And right. in that Walker Homes uh, community, there are some very, very low lines all over that community. And, and I know that it has been neglected. That was the reason why I was asking, because my parents' homes, even though they are deceased, but I have an older sister who's there. And it is the power lines that there, but they are very low. And even a, uh, my SUV from time to time will hit the top of the power lines because it's so low in the back of, uh, in the driveway area. And that is all over that community. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Yeah. I, I will check in on that. 
Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. I appreciate you all coming. Laura, thanks for making sure they didn't get in trouble today with anything they said to us. Uh, but again, thank you very much. Uh, this has been on the mind of several, and we appreciate you making yourselves available to answer these questions. Uh, so I thank you. We do have a quorum, and we w there is no uh, one signed up for public comment period, so we're going to move directly into our agenda. And we're going to start with our consent agenda. Uh, and I'll go through the consent agenda items by number. Anybody uh, wants to pull anything from the, uh, the consent agenda, let me know. I'll then read the captions. You'll have an, uh, another opportunity to do that before we vote. First item is RS 2023-2347, 2343-2348, 2348-2349, 2351-2352, 2352-2353, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2352-2358, 2
after we get through these other two quickly. Uh, RS 2023-2381, Druffle and other sponsors approves a construction agreement between CSX Transportation Inc. and the Nashville Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for the reimbursement of CSXT performed railroad crossing safety improvements at Davidson Road near Harding Pike. There is a proposed amendment by Council Member Druffle. Um, you wanna... Let's see if, does anybody want to move that amendment and I'll get the general counsel to explain it to us. Ms. Darby. Uh, this is a housekeeping amendment. Uh, there was a typographical error in the amount of the uh, agreement. Dollar figure. Any questions regarding this amendment? All in favor of the amendment? Yeah. Any opposed? Uh, amendment pass, uh, recommend approval of the amendment. Now on the bill as amended, do we have any discussion? All in favor of the bill is amended? Aye. All right. Any opposed? Uh, bill is recommended for approval. RS 2023-2382. Evans and other sponsors approves an intergovernmental agreement between USDOT and NDOT for the acceptance of strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation grant to install LIDAR and video camera technologies at key intersections and mid-block se segments for near-miss data collection. Uh, Moved and properly seconded. Councilmember Nash, do you have any? Yeah, I, so, somebody refresh my memory about what LIDAR is. It sounds like something my wife would use, but I'm not being <laughs> completely truthful. Okay. Um, Uh, good evening. It is actually uh, a camera technology uh, or like an infrared that's actually able to detect the difference between a pedestrian, a car, or a bicyclist. So it, it, it's better defining the modes out there for us. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Swope. Oh, you just wanted to answer the question. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions relative to this bill? All right. All in favor? Any opposed? All right, recommend approval. We do have a late resolution by Councilmember O'Connell, uh, authorizes Nashville Urban Venture LLC to construct and install an aerial encroachment at 607 Overton Street. Um, do we, that's the only sponsor on there. You wanna jump on it with him? Okay, Councilmember Brown is going to jump on as a sponsor. Bill is moved uh, properly. Second, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? All right, recommend approval. Now we go to RS 2023-2342. Syracuse and other sponsors approves full implementation of license plate reader technology by the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department following the July 22nd, 2023 conclusion of the pilot implementation. Uh, do we have a motion? Motion moved and properly seconded. We do have a proposed amendment by Council Member Syracuse. Does somebody want to move that amendment to get it on the floor? All right, moved properly seconded. Councilmember Syracuse for an explanation on the amendment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the amendment does three things, and it basically brings some greater transparency and a little more collaboration. Um, first, it just articulates that this isn't done here with, with this tonight. Uh, it has to go before the next council for procurement, uh, deployment, and, and whatnot. Um, it also talks about vendor contracts having to be compliant with federal, state, and local law and MNPD policies. Um, also includes a termination clause that kicks in if there's incre uh, credible indications of breach or un unintended disclosure. And then finally, um, the amendment does provide that uh, MNPD policies will require consultation with community groups in each precinct in determining where to place uh, LPR devices. So I'm hoping that uh, gives a little more clarity on the process where we are and also shows that this is a collaborative effort. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Syracuse. Questions on the amendment? Council Member Sepulveda, join us. Thank you, uh, Chair, for recognizing me even though I'm not on the committee. Um, right. I, I do have a question. Who would be the community groups in each precinct that would be brought in? To whom you want to direct that uh, question? To uh, Council Member Syracuse. Council Member Syracuse. Um, can I defer to the administration or chief on, on that? Thank you. Do you want to count, uh, 
I forget what to call you now. Is it Chief, Commander, Captain Gilder? Why don't you update us on your rank? Yes, sir. Chris Gilder of the Metro Nashville Police Department. I'm huh? a deputy chief. Um, these are the community advisory committees that Chief Drake directed all the precinct commanders to uh, develop within their precincts. They are uh, comprised of a, a myriad of different groups. They're citizen groups, uh, homeowners associations, businesses, uh, local universities, uh, faith-based groups. Um, so it's a, a collaboration of uh, individuals from those types of communities. All right, uh, follow up. Where is the list of these groups and what are the demographic makeup of the groups? I can get you a list of the current groups. I don't have one on hand with me right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions regarding the amendment? Council Member Gamble. Just a comment. I appreciate Council Member uh, Syracuse for bringing this amendment forward. I am familiar with the uh, community groups that work with the Madison Precinct or the community group that works with the Madison Precinct. And it is a well-rounded group of community leaders, a diverse group. And I appreciate that we are looking at using those groups uh, that have been established and already working in the community and working with MMPD to help in facilitating where the license plate readers uh, will go in the in the implementation stage. So I just want to thank and commend uh, Council Member Syracuse for bringing that forward. Thank you, Council Member Gamble. Uh, also, I failed to recognize our distinguished police chief who is here joining us at the administration table. Thanks for joining us at today's meeting, Chief Drake. Any other questions relative to the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment? Oh, oh hold on just one second. Uh, Council Member Sapoli, you got other questions? Sorry, uh, follow up, um, forgot to ask, would anybody from the Community Oversight Board also be participating in these groups? Um, would you want that address to the Community Oversight Board? We've got somebody here from the COB. Whoever, I just didn't know if they had been reached out to as well to participate. Or Turk or any of the other groups. Hi. This is on. Hi, I'm Dave Kiley. I'm the assistant director of MNCO. I would say um, no. I would push back on Council Member Syracuse's statement that this has been a collaborative process. Since July 1, information sharing between us and the department has been um, bad, for lack of a better word. Um, we don't know anything about these groups. We would echo the same question that was already asked. Um, we have no idea who's in them. We have no idea what the demographics look like, um, and we have not been invited to participate um, in any of that, if that answers the question. Go ahead, Council Member uh, Spolvedo. Okay, follow-up question. Why wasn't the Community Oversight Board brought in? Um, do we want that addressed to the administration? That would, that'd be a question for the police department, I think. We're here. To Com Commander Gilder? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't get that out of my mind. It's okay. Uh, the directive was to initiate groups formed of individuals that live, reside, work uh, in the precincts uh, which are affected. So that's who we reached out to. Um, with respect to information being provided to COB regarding these groups, I'm personally unaware of any requests regarding information supplied to them about the groups, just like I offered to supply the names to you, I'm happy to supply that to them as well. Council Member Sepulveda. I, I guess that answers my question. If this amendment was to go on and if um, this legislation was to pass tonight, would the Community Oversight Board be brought into those conversations? And to whom you want to direct that? MMPD. Um, Chief Gilder, I got to write that down. So I'm sorry, was the question was if the amendment passes, would COB be involved in? So I, I, I might direct this to the administration with respect to the language that's in the amendment, I, I don't want to misspeak. That would give you a microphone, wouldn't it? 
So the uh, precinct community advisory groups are composed of, it's an outreach to citizens, individuals. It's not an organizational outreach. There's certainly no prohibition against any member of the COB being a member of the any uh, precinct advisory group. There are eight such precincts. They have uh, members from within the community of each precinct. Uh, they have council members involved in those community advisory groups. So I understand Council Member Hauser is a regular attendee. I don't want to put it on the spot. I think Council Member Evans is a regular attendee. But again, the focus is on, on individuals, not organizational outreach, but certainly no prohibition against COB members being part of it. Great, thank you. So to reiterate, would the COB and other organizations be invited to the table? I say that because there are key community groups um, that we personally as a city uh, might struggle to do outreach to that a lot of these organizations have established um, relationships with. And so I think it would be beneficial if this were to pass to make sure that they were at the table as well and the community oversight board uh, overall to have, you know, another layer of transparency if if that all makes sense. Is that for, uh, is that a question for anyone? Or it's more of a comment. Okay, all right, thank you. I do wanna make this one statement. I'm happy to entertain questions outside of the committee. Uh, I just wanna be clear that uh, we're gonna have a separate public safety uh, committee meeting on this very same issue. Happy to entertain them, just wanna make sure not to duplicate the effort. Uh, Councilmember Porterfield, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. I'll be super brief and thank you for uh, acknowledging me even though I'm not a member of the committee. Um, piggybacking off of my colleague, am I right? Uh, right, yeah, my colleague to my right. Um, who ultimately makes the decision? So when the, the question was posed, if the community oversight board could be a part of the process, MMPD is deferring to administration. We are about to have an administration change. So is it, you know, if the amendment were to pass, um, does the administration make the decision on who's able to participate? Does, is it uh, Chief Drake, is it MMPD, is it the council? Who's making that decision? To whom are you addressing that question? So whomever can answer the question. Administration, I'll just kick that to you. So remember, this will be a multi-layered uh, approach, and this is not the last bite of the apple by the council. It comes back to the council at least two more times. Uh, one of the times it will come back is for the vendor contracts. Each vendor contract has to be approved by this body, and it can only be approved by this body after a separate public hearing. Now the contracts, the proposal is that those contracts require compliance with police policy and the police policy in turn will require placement location, placement decisions for cameras be in consultation with the community advisory groups. If that is not to your satisfaction within the contract that comes to you before approval, after a public hearing, you have the opportunity to turn it down. But I think giving the police department the opportunity to do that to your satisfaction is the route to go here. I know you've heard that these are in place in 90 communities throughout Tennessee. There is not one, not one that comes close to the requirements imposed for LPR uses in Davidson County. You know what it takes to put a, ca a camera up in 90% of the cities in Tennessee? Buy a camera, that's it. You're ready to go. But here, the number of restrictions that are imposed exceeds by tenfold any restrictions you have in any other part of the state. And this is one of those additions that we believe makes this fully transparent and engages the citizens in each precinct on where cameras are placed. Thank you, I appreciate that so much. Um, if I could just clarify my question. M my question is simply, who will make the decision about those community groups? Like, you know, is the administration making that decision or is MMPD making the decision? I apologize if I wasn't clear on the question. No, no, I mean, it's just like any other participatory engagement by the police department. The police makes invitations, asks people to participate and, and responds to whoever wants to, to be on these uh, panels. But again, if that's not being done to your satisfaction at the time that the contract comes up, when it's put in ink, I think that's your opportunity to act. 
Okay, thank thank you for, uh, thank. I appreciate you for sharing that because MMPD just directed the question to administration. So it appears as though MMPD is not sure who's able to participate in these community groups, which is why I wanted clarity. So I appreciate it. Okay, Council Member Hurt, I will come back to you, Council Member Sepulveda, once we get committee members. I don't, I don't have a question, uh, but I appreciate you acknowledging me, Chair. But because the Community Oversight Board was voted for by 60% of the citizens, that is a community of citizens. And I think that what we've got to do is be truthful and honest and open for these discussions. If we want people to embrace the things that we're doing where there is some opposition, if we were open and speaking carefully and um, engaging the community in doing so, I think it'll be so much easier because we all want our communities to be safer. People that are opposing the LPRs are not against a safe community. And I think those that who are in favor want a safe community as well. But if we decided that we wanted a community oversight board, then we should also give them the respect because given the community oversight board respect, you're giving the citizens of this city respect. And I think we need to acknowledge that and include them and not expect them to come to us and say we need to be there. Because it's already been established in the legislation uh, or in the referendum when the citizens spoke. So I, I, I just don't like the, 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 the tension that seems to be going back and forth here when we are all working to make our city safer for all Nashvilleians. And we need to do it collaboratively, collectively, and together. All right, I completely agree, Councilmember Hurt. I, I just, I don't think that police maintains a list of who's exempt or excluded from the advisory boards. There's not, there's not a list. There's no exclusion of the COB whatsoever. And I think that's absolutely a wonderful idea that the police engage COB members. If that makes sense to, to you and to others, uh, the police department do have to comply with the ordinances of this body. You may enact that ordinance in the coming months, but the, the it's just common courtesy. It's just common courtesy, in, in my opinion. Agreed. And I think what we need to do is stop talking about we don't exclude, mm -hmm. but we've got to be intentional about including. We've already said that we were going to engage them because we created that in a referendum and it was voted on. So let's just do it. Because when you don't, then it appears that you are trying to hide something, that you're doing something that you don't want the public to know. Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. I've got people in the queue just so I can be transparent. Councilmember Nash, Councilmember Henderson, Councilmember Swope, Councilmember Allen, and I will come back to you, Councilmember Sepulveda, once the committee members have uh, spoken. Councilmember Nash, the floor is yours. Oh, hold on, let me get you some. Go ahead. Uh, with all due respect, you're absolutely right. The city voted for a community oversight board, and they're given certain authority to review what's going on at the police department and make comment on it. Tonight, this was passed out a report from the CLB. They're involved, just because they're not necessarily on, on that particular committee at any given precinct that is, is trying to be inclusive of people who live there, doesn't mean that the CLB is being ignored. I don't see it. I mean, here we are. We're getting uh, advice from them and their opinions. And, and, and welcome the discussion. And that goes for Turk, same thing. I, we had a report last uh, uh, council meeting from Turk. Uh, they're being involved. They're making their voices heard. We're listening. Uh, I, I think to, to pick on this one committee that's at a precinct is, is being unfair and, and uh, kind of ignoring the real relationships and input we are getting from these groups. Thank you, Councilmember Manash. We are on the amendment. Uh, Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is to uh, Chief Drake. So we have precinct community advisory groups as a proper noun in this resolution. And so I wonder if these groups are 
formalized uh, anywhere as to kind of uh, best practices or is that at the discretion of each precinct commander? Um, I, I commend your uh, 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 desire to and um, encouragement of your precincts uh, establishing groups such as this. Um, but when we uh, formalize something in this manner and we say that we shall require consultation with these groups, yet it does not sound like these groups are actually formally established or have any kind of bylaws about how they work or what they do. Um, can you just speak more specifically to um, uh, these these groups and if, if there's uh, any place online where it sort of lives, uh, how they should operate, who they will comprise, uh, best practices through your precincts on how to create the groups and maintain the groups and communicate and so forth, sir. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely, and thank you for that question. So I got the idea from the New York Police Department when I visited NYPD, and so they use community advisory groups to pull uh, community members from a precinct uh, that for, they represent each district within a precinct. And so they work with a council member to address a, a myriad of issues they may have. It could be uh, trash collection, it could be crime in a certain area. And so whatever that issue is from that community member, they can, they can coordinate with the council member or different departments within uh, Metro to try to get whatever accomplished. I am writing a crime plan. The crime plan is coming together and it talks more broadly about community advisory groups, but it's not meant to exclude any particular group. It's, it's designed for the precinct commander and members of that community to address issues and concerns that they may have. They may have drug dealing uh, that's going on in a particular area and, and they want to express that. What can we do? Who all can be involved? Uh, we have uh, kids that are hanging out. It doesn't look like uh, they have an adult that's supervising them, or we have an elderly person who may need help. And so it's just a myriad of issues to where the community can be involved, have a voice, and then we can work in a, in a collaborative effort uh, with anything. So. so then just to clarify, it is informal, not specifically established or listed anywhere about how it should be done. It is just a suggestion on your part to your uh, commanders and community affairs coordinators that each precinct should have one, but there is no kind of, um, you know, suggested uh, bylaws, best practices. Um, it, there's nothing formalized about these groups. Not formalized yet, but there is a crime plan that should be done in about a month, so I'm writing it myself, and it'll be formalized in the crime plan. So, so the these groups that we are including in legislation now mm -hmm. are just, that's then prospectively, and so we're going to rely on your word here that that will be formalized in a crime plan is, is that a master plan for the police department or what is a crime plan, please, so sir? It's for the police department, but it, it talks about the various ways we'll address crime uh, in various areas. So it may be um, if there's a area that's having um, people squatting in homes and, and we need to clean up an area, uh, it may be there's gang activity or whatever's going on in a particular area, it'll be addressed through those community groups with the commander, and then it comes to crime meetings that we have weekly. The crime meetings is where we talk as command staff about all the issues and then we address them. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't try to arrest our way out of this. We try to find solutions to help people. And so that's part of the solution process too. And that's all been written. Okay, well, if I may, particular to the precinct community advisory groups um, that are in this amendment um, about uh, which we are, you know, discussing uh, right now. I, would you say, Chief Drake, um, that over time, um, when we do have uh, standing community meetings or meetings addressing crime at our precincts, 
that the folks that are often likely to show up for those meetings may trend older, not currently employed. Um, I think we as council members sometimes struggle to get a very balanced perspective internal to our districts because of people who have young families, um, people who are employed at, you know, a, a different set of hours and so forth. And so I have found often in my district that it is difficult for me um, to ascertain uh, the, uh, I, I have to be very intentional about seeking out different perspectives um, because I do find kind of the folks that show up at these meetings, so to speak, um, do often represent a certain cohort of individuals, whether by age or income or free time and so forth. Mm -hmm. Would you acknowledge that that's uh, true? So oftentimes there are older, but the commanders are reaching out to each district. So if you have six districts within a precinct, then each district I have a representative from that particular district that'll come to these meetings. So that'll be six community members. Uh, I've seen a wide array from younger to older. So I don't know how your area was, but majority are older, uh, involved, and wanna do things, but there are younger as well. Uh, the precinct commanders pick the various community members and then we have council members involved. I wanted to make sure that was involved as well. And as we move forward, we're not looking to exclude anyone. We're gonna to continue to build on this. This is just the police department's way to make sure the community is, is involved in reducing crime and, and, and have an effect on other things that are going on in the community. I appreciate that very much. And I, I do genuinely appreciate those efforts and and I do uh, believe them to be um, sincere. It is just my concern that something that is not yet formalized, a precinct community advisory group that, you know, requiring consultation, I, I just think it creates kind of a level of complexity around expectations. Um, and if we're not maybe uh, formalizing likewise um, the consultation with our uh, COB, which is formalized and codified and has bylaws and so forth, that that, that is more um, accountable um, than uh, these efforts, which you know I understand to be well-intentioned, but I think over time will trend in certain ways that might not be fully representative of the community. So I just wanted to articulate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Henderson. Council Member Swope. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As much as I'd love to call a question, I know we can't do that in committee. So um, about 90% of what I was just gonna ask Chief Drake, Council Lady Henderson just did. So I've got one addition to what Council Member Henderson just went through with you, and that is on a precinct level, right? Is anybody excluded from these community advisory group meetings? That's a good question. No one is excluded. It's up to the commander to find members within that community who want to solve problem solve together to help the, the uh, community become safer. And that's just a coordinated meeting with the commanders. So it, it's, and as, as council member Henderson just said, I commend you as well for the, for the absolute transparent grassroots outreach into our community. Um, the COB, I believe we all created as, a, as an overriding group to oversee police actions on a countywide level. These community advisory groups, correct me if I'm wrong, they operate on a neighborhood level for all intents and purposes. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll reiterate the point that you just reiterated, which is these meetings are publicly acknowledged and anybody who wants to show up, including members of the COB, are welcome to join. Am I correct? Correct. Great, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Swope. Council Member Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just wondering if we wanna have the conversation of would it, would it be helpful to add to the amendment that it would require consultation with the COB and citizens who comprise the community precinct advisor groups? I mean, would that, would that address the concern that's being expressed here? And would that be a, a potential solution? Let me uh, kick it to the sponsor. Who 
Councilmember Syracuse, the, were your thoughts? And or, perhaps also a response from the MMPD as well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am hearing that nobody's excluded. So um, if we start going down the list of these are the groups that are the ones to be engaged, uh, where does that end? So I don't know if we just need further articulation about how meetings are scheduled and are they open to the public? So that means any group, whether it's a neighborhood group, a local chamber of commerce, uh, and any other kind of organization is allowed to come. Uh, maybe we just need better clarity on how how the engagement is going to be uh, to, to work before we go down a rabbit hole of start listing off uh, organizations. All right, and you wanted this address to the police department and Chief Drake? So as has been stated, we're not gonna exclude absolutely anyone. Uh, we don't mind uh, putting out a list of when those meetings are gonna be. We can have the commanders do that and we'll make it open. Uh, it'll be for the community members to problem solve uh, crime and issues in their community with that particular council member who's invested. But if people wanna be there to listen, uh, and then that's fine too. Uh, but we have to have a working group of people that are totally invested in making the community safer. Um, and so um, no one's excluded. Is that satisfactory? Okay. Council member Cash, did you have your name up? Uh, I thought you said you had your hand up. I think Chief Drake answered my main question. Um, as a answer to council member Swope's question, but, but I, I guess we, you know, we'll be notified of these community meetings. They're open to the public. If there are, if we, if there are folks that we want to be there, we can, we certainly are allowed to invite them to the meetings. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. But we, so the police department is going to abide by whatever the council wants us to do. That's, we've done that for every bit of legislation within the LPRs, and we'll continue with that aspect. So whatever you all decide, uh, every three months there's an audit we have to present to council to make sure that we're doing things appropriately. We'll continue to do that. Every regulatory provision that's out there, we've abided by, and we'll, and we'll do whatever's asked of us. So. Yeah, and if I could follow up with, um, so this is a this is an amendment on a bill about LPRs, and I think part of the reason for the for the amendment is that there's been some uh, concern about input about where the cameras are placed. So I guess I just want, and I, and I, we've talked about a number of issues, and it sounds like it's a very broad committee, but I guess I just want reassurance that that's something that the the cameras and and where they're placed, or if there are issues with where they're placed. Uh, will be part of discussion at some point in these meetings. Absolutely, and we're not opposed to whatever those locations are, bringing them before council to say, these are the areas that we're looking at, and if council says, no, we don't, or whatever, then we'll abide by that. Uh, so we're gonna, we just wanna make sure we keep our community safe, and we wanna make sure we have equity around, and so if we have community members involved, we thought that would be a best practice. Thank you, Councilmember Cash. A little quick update on the queue. Councilmember Hertz next, followed by uh, <coughs> Councilmember Sepulveda Evans and Councilmember Rosenberg. Councilmember Hertz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Is it possible for MNPD PR to reach out to the radio stations, the local radio stations, and be a part of their community service announcements, or and, and even make sure that those announcements are uh, registered here with the council when? Uh, the meetings are held, and just trying to reach those people who may not, you know, people that work at, at different hours and unable to reach during the times that the meetings are being held, but may be able to work something. We've got to get to the people when they can't get to us. So I'm just asking that we make that extra effort in order to communicate. And, and I think that's basically all that's being you know, shared here is that we're just trying to reach the people in any way that we possibly can to ensure that they all are being gotcha. included. Not that they're being excluded, but we have intentional inclusion. Yes, we can do that, and we can do that with our social media as well. So we'll try to reach everyone where we can. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hurt. Uh, I've added you to the queue, Council Member Porterfield. Council Member Sepulveda, the floor is yours. Sorry, I think you had mentioned Council Member Evans before me, and she's on the committee, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, oh okay. She's, no, she's not. Okay. On. I have several questions. Um, 
Okay. Um, I, I guess I would like to add the community oversight board onto this amendment for several reasons, right? Because if they're not added, then we are not required to have them at the table. It is one thing for people to uh, email us and give us handouts. I mean, we have conspiracy theories that are sent to us all the time and those people aren't really at the table. Um, you know, it was stated uh, by the chief, if people want to be there to listen, Right, that's not the same thing as actually participating and having, um, you know, a voice when it comes to these matters, which is the placement of the LPRs. Um, so I, I mean, I would caution on the side of Council Member Allen and actually add that language into uh, this amendment. Um, you know, I guess my questions are. For these community groups, um, are we going to have interpreters there? Is the advertisement of when these meetings are going to be in multiple language? What means of communication are going to be used to get the word out that they are happening? Is it going to be not just the council members putting that out, not just on uh, MMPD social media like council member Hurt had suggested? Is it going to be on... Uh, radio stations? Is it going to be on the Spanish radio stations? I, I mean, I have so many questions. Um, another one that I had, right, is regarding um, another piece of this amendment, which was that we would, for the part about compliance with the state law, what happens if the state changes the law and the contract has already been signed? Like, are we able to come back and amend the contract at that point? And I guess that would be a question for Director Darby. Director Dar Darby. The, the way the language is written, um, it would be compliance with state, with federal, state, and local laws, rules, and regulations. That would be um, as amended. So if the state law is amended at some point in the future, the contract would be, the contractor would be obliged to comply with the state law as amended. Right, and so if the state law has the regulations on LPR at a lower at a lower bar, does that override our regulations? It would depend. I would have to see the the state law. It would depend. More than likely, it would. If the state law was to come in and enact um, LPR legislation, it would more than likely preempt what we currently have in place. Great. Thank you. So I, I guess my, my question is for the sponsor. We are asking for, I am asking for one organization, which is the Community Oversight Board, to be listed on this amendment. And if other organizations want to attend and participate, then, then that's great. Um, but would the sponsor be open to adding that as an amendment to his amendment? Let me uh, make a suggestion before I turn it over. I, I'm going to let uh, Councilmember Syracuse ask that question, but we've had uh, now one member of the committee and uh, another member talk about uh, amending the amendment. So as a matter of procedure, uh, my recommendation would be that we uh, vote on the uh, uh, current amendment properly filed because it's going to require suspension of the rules on the floor and uh, uh, rather than vote on a, uh, have a committee recommendation on a verbal amendment, work with uh, the general counsel Darby on language to amend the amendment on the floor and then suspend the rules and present the amendment at that time. Does that sound satisfactory to either of you two? Okay. Yeah, Council Member Syracuse, you want to address Council Member Sepulveda's question? Thank you, Chair. I don't have a problem with it because I don't want anybody excluded. So if it, we need extra clarity to make sure that this is uh, this is the intent of, of this body, then that, that's fine with me. So are you good with that course of action, Council Member Sepulveda? Yes, sir. Pulvita? Yes, Chair. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Council Member Evans?
I think the relevance of my question is sailed because of the potential amendment to the amendment. So I'll let it go for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Evans. Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Darby, do the, the all this amendment has is recitals. Is that correct? Yes. Do recitals have the force of law? They do not. They inform the language that's uh, the, the action portion of the resolution. They would inform the language if there was ever a uh, question about ambiguity. So if it went to court because there was ambi ambiguity, that's when this would matter? Yes. Okay. But this is not really stuff that's ambiguity. So this doesn't amend the ordinance in any way? It does not amend the contents of the, of the resolution. So really, unless there's some sort of judgment call that ends up in court, this amendment doesn't do anything at all. The amendment informs it, the, the resolution. So even if it doesn't go to court, um, I think also though uh, departments would be informed by the recitals as well and how to act and go forward. But you are correct that it does not have the force of law. Okay, thank you. So basically like we could put that everybody has to do a dance around the sun and it would have, I mean, this, is, this conversation is a waste of time respectfully, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenberg. Councilmember Porterfield. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I'm going to make it super brief, especially behind uh, Councilmember Rosenberg's uh, remarks. Um, I did want to follow up on Councilmember Sepulveda's question because it was not answered. Um, will the meeting notices be in multiple languages? And that's directed to uh, Chief Drake. Chief Drake. And will there be a translator? So there's been, we've always been transparent and inclusive in every community. We work well with, we started the Office of Outreach and Community Partnerships. There, uh, we have Asian, we have Hispanic, uh, we have LGBTQ, we have every thing that we have within the department. And so any language that we can put out through those groups, we will. And we have great uh, a working relationship with Plaza Mariachi and other places. And so we'll continue to communicate and reach people where they are. So. Where the, where, will there be a translator at the meetings? If we have a translator, we can. So we have people within the department that can translate. And so we will have people there if we need to be. Okay, thank you. And then I just wanted to get clarity to make sure that we are all talking about the same thing here because I, I pulled up an email that I have uh, from MMPD. Um, these are, we, we are talking about the advisory committees, correct? This is, is this the name of the committee that we're referring to? The precinct advisory committees? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I know that you all are saying that this is inclusive to everyone, but the email that I have says, at most, we uh, when I asked, could we bring four people? That would be the most. We try to keep it under 10. So I know you all are saying that these are public meetings in which anyone is able to come, but MMPD is saying that you all want these to be intimate meetings and you want them to be smaller meetings. And I do commend uh, MMPD for reaching out to the council members to get our input on who we would like when I was reached out to about having someone to come to the advisory council meeting. And again, I want to, this is, um, not to disparage uh, the, the person who reached out to me because I think very highly of them and they do work so hard to work with the community. So I wanna make sure that I'm not disparaging them. When they reached out, there was no conversation about this, that these community uh, groups were going to be a part of the LPR conversation. Um, and thinking about someone to reach, to, to, to represent my district in these meetings, there was no conversation about, you know, do we need to think about diversity? Do we need to think about uh, any of those things? It was just, you know, my thought is who can actually come to these meetings? Because I know that a lot of people in the community work, a lot of people aren't able to come to meetings. So when I was asked about a representative, I'm thinking through someone with a vested interest and the availability to come, which is how I came upon, you you know, the person that I was making the suggestion for. So I think, you know, I appreciate you all working with the council members to get our input, but there was no, you know, there's no concerted effort of uh, inclusion with regards to, to council member Hurt's point earlier. Um, you know, while there, the no one may be excluded, but we also have to make sure that we are being inclusive. So it's, it's not enough to say that we're not gonna exclude Turk, we're not gonna exclude the CLB. We have to take it a step further and say, we're gonna intentionally 
be exclusive, uh, excuse me, be inclusive to these groups because they do bring a, a very important perspective. And, you know, an organization like Turk, which represents immigrants across the city, um, you know, that may not be just the, the lived experience of a, a huge number of people in one specific district, but that is an experience of people across the city and their voices are important. But we have to make sure that they are part of this conversation as well. So uh, with that, I just want to say, uh, one, I'm going to push and ask that you all are not just not excluding anyone, but that you are intentionally exclusive, uh, inclusive, excuse me, and including the community oversight board and organizations like Turk. And then two, I just want to make sure that that we are putting it on the record um, that you all are saying that they're that is open to the public. But MMPD has, has said to me directly in email that you all want to keep it under ten people. So uh, thank you for all of that. So the community advisor groups was started to deal with crime and issues within a community, uh, whatever concerns may be. It could be drugs, it could be crime, it could be child care, it could be kids running around, it could be grass that needs cut, cutting. And so each district would have a representative and a council member to problem solve whatever that whatever those myriad of issues uh, could be. And as I said, people could come and listen, but we want to keep that group small, people that are invested within that particular district that actually want to deal with this crime. So if someone lives, um, say, on my street, and, and they're involved in a community within my area, and they want to say, hey, we, so I have it in my area, and I've talked to my council member about it, and I've talked to other people, a drainage issue in a community I live in. So if people want to talk about that, then that's what, you know, we address. Uh, council member Syracuse wanted to add those groups uh, to the LPR discussion because they're already invested in what we're trying to do to reduce crime and problem solve in the community. So. <laughs> Anything else, Councilmember Porterfield? Okay, thank you. Um, Councilmember Evans? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, as the, I think I'm the only person that's involved in attending one of these groups here in the room. Um, and I just wanted to comment that the, I would consider these groups as still forming, like we're not, it's not a formal conversation. Uh, it, it's very attendee driven and resident driven based on what do they want to talk about after MNPD provides kind of an overview of, you know, basic um, crime stats for the area. And then they take feedback and questions and everything from anybody who is there uh, to be able to address whatever those concerns are. And so I think there's a lot of flexibility for these groups as far as some of the, the questions that um, are being heard you know, about leveraging um, this group. But I would also say that there's some sensitive information that's shared, you know, that's specific to, um, you know, business owners in the area or, um, you know, renters that may be attending, whomever is there. And so I can understand why there may not, you know, maybe the group needs to evolve and it becomes, um, you know, way more public and there's way more attendees and that kind of thing. But it also starts to limit, I think, some of the conversation about what is happening in communities. And so I just wanted to point that out, that I think some of the goal of the group may end up being lost depending on how the group evolves over time um, and if it's necessary to evolve. But I think there's definitely, there's been flexibility at least from my precinct commander and um, community coordinator um, about how this information is shared. And so just wanted to point that out. And I think it's, um, you know, being prescriptive is one thing, and I know we want to prescribe a lot of activity, and I'm open to the idea of, like, you know, the community oversight board being involved, and that's a great conversation for the rules committee because we're about to appoint all these folks back to the review board as it's been reconstituted about their interest in being involved related to their precincts um, and where they live um, to bring that needed voice. So just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Just by way of reminder, we are on the amendment and uh, this is Transportation Committee. We will revisit this very same issue in public safety and health, which uh, immediately follows this meeting here in the chamber. So I uh, just want to make sure people aren't duplicating their efforts. Uh, Councilmember Benedict, you are next. Are oh, you want to wait? Okay. All right. Councilmember Sepulveda, back to you. Hold on. Let me undo these mics. Thank you, Chair. I And I appreciate uh, Councilmember Evans giving us that information. I guess my question would be, you know, if these groups are still forming, 
and if the policy around the group is still forming, wouldn't we want to wait to implement something like this, something like the groups and LPRs until we have all our ducks in a row? I mean, we're talking about the placement of license plate readers. These groups are going to be, you know, advising MMPD. Um, and we've already seen from the data that has been shared with us that, you know, a high percentage of the license plate readers have been established in low income non-white areas. That's been the majority of them. So we're bringing in community members to speak on this and advise on this, but we don't have the community oversight board on there yet. We have no uh, regulations or stipulations of what the parameters of these groups would be. So I, I guess I that's something I wanna see. I wanna see which groups are have been invited already, the list of groups. I wanna know the makeup of what the groups look like now and what are the targets for, you know, what are the, the demographic targets? Is it, you know, 45% minority? Is it, 50% women, I, I don't have any of that information. Is there a place where we could find out what, what, the, what the makeup of these groups would look like? It's your question for the chief? Yes, sir. Chief Drake. Yes, we can get you that information. So each community advisory group is picked, someone is picked from that particular district. So it doesn't exclude a particular area. So if you live in an area that some people consider vulnerable, you can be a part of that community advisory group. Or if you're in another area, you can be a part of it. So, But we can get you the people that are involved that are picked by the commander and people that's within that community. So we can get that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief. Uh, would we receive that before tonight's council meeting? I don't think we can get that that quick, so. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sepulveda. Anybody else? Councilmember Gamble, um, hold on. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add, while I had not had a chance to attend one of the advisory committee meetings in, my, in the precinct in my area, I get regular communication about the meeting times, the meeting dates. I, I have a list of everyone who is in, on that committee for, from all of the districts, uh, including my own, and I and I communicate regularly with the representatives in my district that are on this committee. So I just want to add that I applaud MMPD for establishing these advisory committees. They are uh, uh, include a, a group of neighborhood leaders, people who have who are established within their neighborhoods and the communities and they have been working with the community outreach um, officer for each precinct, as well as the commanders in each precinct, and all of the council members should have been involved. I do have one question. Do all of the precincts have these advisory committees? So, so each precinct within the county has these advisory committees? Yes, they do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gamble. Any other discussion on the amendment? Councilmember Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I know that uh, the majority of our discussion has uh, centered around these uh, precinct community advisory groups, um, but I wanted to look at some of the uh, earlier recitals that I think um, I think this whole amendment is intended uh, to address uh, concerns uh, that have come up through this process. And I think, you know, my concern often is when we have something in recitals to Councilman Rosenberg's point um, that these do not have force of law, um, that uh, that then can create confusion um, in the community, um, sometimes as far as the perception of, you know, kind of what we're doing or what is being done. I do appreciate that we're having this conversation, um, that we are uh, potentially adding this uh, uh, to uh, the resolution from an accountability standpoint. And so I think uh, one of the other concerns about uh, this system, if it were to be implemented, uh, is uh, fiscal concerns. Um, and those are some of, uh, uh, 
I share those concerns. And so um, I appreciate that we've got some uh, recitals here about uh, the procurement process and so on and so forth. But I guess my question would be then to the administration, uh, as long as we have broached uh, procurement, uh, cost, contracting, and so forth by way of this amendment. Um, has this administration ever made an assessment in partnership with MNPD, given that we are 526 square miles and we have thousands and thousands of road miles and so many intersections, um, what we anticipate the cost would be uh, for a system of this size and its maintenance. Because I think we are often proffered uh, results from cities that are three square miles or you know, 10, 20, 30 square miles. We are unique um, in this state and in some regard in the United States for our sheer geographical size. And so while an area that is adjacent um, to my district, city of Belmead, um, can effectively gate itself, right? Because it can put up camera, 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 camera on every intersection. And it has, because I live in the Metro USD adjacent to this satellite city that has implemented this program. And so when I think about the potential cost, that is a very concerning factor to me. And so um, I would like to understand uh, from this administration and MNPD, what I hear is like, well, we can't know until we put it out to procurement, right? Cart, horse, horse cart, whatever. Um, so has anyone had, first, have you had conversations about the potential cost? Second, has there been an estimate about what that cost would be? Even if those are informal conversations, what is the number um, that is discussed in conversations in this administration about uh, implementing this program at scale, please? Sure, thank you, Councilor Anderson. Um, so the procurement rules are pretty tight on what we can discuss, what we can know. I don't know who the vendors are. I don't know what their price structure is. We know from peer cities that the average cost for per camera, uh, operation everything uh, over a year is about $3,000. We know that we're 117 cameras deployed during the pilot. So if you do the math, that's somewhere in the $350,000 range for assuming we stick with the, the number of cameras that were done during uh, the pilot. Uh, we know that compared to the personnel costs that those saved, it's, it, is, it struck us as fairly dramatic. If you were to simply monitor a single intersection using personnel, estimated cost was about $800,000 for one intersection versus cameras that never get sick, never ask for a day off. So the, the expediency and efficiency of the camera system, as we have learned from both the police department but other cities, um, has, has been of... Uh, uh, encouragement to us. But the bottom line at the end of the day is this, this will come back to you at least twice and one of those will be the contract and that will have a price on it. And if you find it too much uh, or not enough, um, then that- I, I appreciate that, Mr. Jameson, but my, my question was at scale for a city of our size, 526 square miles, all the roads that we have, what are the numbers that are under discussion as to the number of cameras that would be required for this system to be effective. And I, I get you're speculating as to cost per camera, $3,000 a year per camera for 117 in the pilot. Are you suggesting that the intent is only to have 117 cameras? Because there are some very small three square mile satellite cities that are almost approaching that number and we're 526 square miles. So I guess I appreciate what you're saying, procurement, et cetera, you know, it'll come back to us. But I think it's fair to ask, since in this amendment, we're starting to kind of put out there what, you know, is gonna happen next from a financial standpoint. I, do you recall my questions to you earlier? Uh, if we had discussions about the cost, if so, what was the estimate for that? 
that what I might do yes. before I go any further, I might, if I can, summon both Chief Blair and Chief Gilder, who may have a little bit more detailed information, um, keeping in mind that they're under the same procurement constraints as... And, and what are those exactly, Mr. Jameson? Can we not talk about a, a number? You, you've said 3K per camera per year. And can we not talk about an actual physical number? Because why? Because that's not a number I got from any of the vendors because I don't know who the vendors are and I'm not allowed to know. When we're not, and and you, you wouldn't want that. What we found that out was from other cities that have deployed this. What are the average per camera costs? But again, no decision will be made on that until it comes back to you. And again, if the price, the deployment level, the, the so volume isn't to your side. No one internal to Metro. So that, that's fine with contractors. No one internal to Metro has speculated around 526 square miles, 5,000 plus road miles, this number of intersections. Nobody's kind of done the math about what they anticipate would be the number of cameras. If I can defer to two people. One, I know we have uh, the procurement division here. I know the procurement division is allowed access to information that nobody else is allowed to have access. But with respect to what is anticipated, if I could defer to Chief Blair and Chief Gilder. Chief Blair, Chief Gilder. Yeah, so with respect to coverage, which I think is what we can speak to, um, while yes, the county is very large, uh, deployment is already limited in the code to major and collector streets. So uh, unlike some satellite cities and other cities, other jurisdictions around the state, I, I, we couldn't place these just anywhere that we wanted to. They are limited in uh, location. And then also I think deployment is going to be uh, guided as uh, we've discussed earlier with respect to community input. Um, so telling you exactly how many cameras are, are going to be deployed, I think depends upon all those factors. The the discussions that we've had were the uh, utilizing the initial number that were utilized during the pilot, um, and then just figuring out where those are going to be deployed. So rough, what we're looking at first year uh, would be 117, and I think we just got to see how the effective they are and how that goes from there and just uh, deciding whether or not we less or more, um, depending on cost effect uh, analysis. So we, we do know how many kind of road miles we have of streets that are classified as major streets and streets that are classified as collectors, mm -hmm. correct? So that's a known value. The, and then, I mean, I, I guess... But I don't have to deploy, I don't mean disrespect. No, I, 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 I'm not going to take it that way. I deploy them and I'm not necessarily looking to deploy them on every mile or quarter mile of the collector yeah. street, so. Yeah. So the ultimate goal, what we learned in quadrant A is if you have cameras close together, you can get a direction of travel. So what we need to do in every other quadrant is what we did in quadrant A and get a direction of travel so the officers can find the car. Just because you get a hit on a car doesn't mean you're going to find the car. So you still have to find it. So really what the question is, do we only want to spend a certain amount of dollars on it? Then we'll spend that certain amount of dollars and then we grow it over time. We don't need to do everything in one year. We, if we want a five-year plan, let's do a five-year plan. But we need to do something get it going, see how we like it. And we can always make adjustments down the line saying, hey, we've had this one out here in a while. It has not worked for us whatsoever. Let's move it. You know, there is movability in this option, but I don't think we just go and say, hey, if we're gonna do the coverage plan. Yes, it's gonna be very, very expensive. But I don't think that's a benefit to the taxpayers. I think we come up with a five-year plan. This is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna grow it by 50 each year until we get to where we wanna get to. I mean, we might be able to save some costs too if we have other regular cameras in the process, not just LPRs that we already have, that would be beneficial too. So then is the assertion that you all have not kind of speculated or anticipated whether full coverage or to your point to get, you know, a direction, uh, you know, based on major and collector streets and so, I mean, Nobody's kind of hypothetically thinking about, you know, okay, well, 117 now, and I hear what you're saying, you know, right. we're going to grow the program based on effectiveness. And so is that 200 cameras? Is that 300 cameras? Is that 400 cameras? Like, I, I think there's a lack of understanding in the community and perhaps even in this body, the scale at which this program will have to be deployed to make it effective. And then subsequent to that, respectfully, if this then creates the knock-on effect of our our next new crime, 
is license plate theft. Well, that's, right? always, that's always been an issue and it always will be an issue. That's not going to change. Right. So what you have in Quadrant Way, what you have six cameras in that location, that's mm -hmm. very effective. You could add more. You'll have to add more because you're going to add more to B, C, and D to get the same effect, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to cause more cameras in Quadrant A because we have to make it balanced. The question comes down to how much money do we want to spend? So if we put a cap on the dollar amount, then that's what we have to spend. And that's what's going to really dictate going forward. I say we go with a 117. We, we move forward with that. We see if we like that and we can grow it as we want to. If you're talking one straight, we can talk Murfreesboro Road or Lebanon Road. You know, in those locations there, there's about 11 intersections coming from the county line in. If you're talking in that general area, 11 all the way around the county would be 88 cameras if you're trying to blanket the county on your major arteries coming in. You still got Old Hickory Boulevard around the county. You still got Briley Parkway to deal with, Ellington Parkway, Elm Hill, Pike. Some of those are some major other ones too. So I, I say we, should, we, we could put a limit on it, 200. Let's do a three-year review, see if we like it, and then we move forward from there. But it's going to come down to the dollars that we want to spend. Okay, I appreciate that insight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. I believe Councilmember Sepulveda, you wanted uh, back to you. Yes, I have budget questions. Um, I, I, I guess my first question is why why didn't this go to the budget committee? I don't know the answer to that. Is it? The it didn't. It wasn't referred to the budget committee. It did not have any direct fiscal impact uh, listed in the legislation. This is a uh, resolution to uh, authorize the full implementation of the program after the, um, the pilot program and uh, the future pieces of legislation that will um, come after this will of course go to the budget and finance yeah. committee. I mean, respectfully, I, I have questions about the procurement process in general that would have gone to the budget committee I, I, similar to council member Henderson, right? I, I have questions as to which vendors have applied. I know that I have stated before and Turk has sent out a memo as well where there have been vendors that other cities have used that have shared information with eyes and with other agencies. So knowing who the vendors are, knowing how much this is gonna cause, we know that they wanna add more cameras because according to MMPD, having more cameras means that they have a better prediction as to where these cars go. How much is that going to cost? I mean, we're, we're about to approve a major piece of legislation not knowing the entirety of what this will cost over the next couple of years. I mean, the community oversight board asked to be involved in the procurement process. I saw an are email. We on, are we on the, we are on the amendment, Councilor Member Well, I thought we were taking questions in general at this point. I, I could Not bring yet. this up Not afterwards, yet. Chair. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we're on, uh, Council Member Henderson's question was uh, somewhat relative to the amendment. So I just want to make sure we stay in there. Um, Council Member Nash, you have anything you want to add to this? Okay. Okay, any other questions on the amendment? All right, seeing none, we're voting on the amendment only. All in favor of the amendment, raise your hands. Seven, eight, nine, that's it. Did it? All right, nobody opposed, so the amendment passes. Now we are on the... <laughs> Now we're on the bill as amended. Any questions on the resolution as amended? I see two who are not committee members. Council Member Sepulveda, now we're going to go back to you and the floor is thank, yours. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Sure. I guess, so my question is, who are, who's in this conversation regarding the procurement selection process, right? I saw an email from uh, our procurement our procurement officer saying that it was people specifically with knowledge to as to license plate readers. So can we have the names of or the agencies that are involved in that procurement process? And my second question is why wasn't the community oversight board involved in the procurement process decision? Can we get somebody from procurement? I believe Michelle Lane is out there. Uh, come to the public table. 
Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I wanna make sure that I understand the question. So you're curious as to who the vendors are? That's one question. Who the evaluators are? And is there any other? I wanna make sure. Okay, so I cannot tell you who the vendors are because it is an active solicitation. It is still in the active bidding process. Part of that process for us coincided with the pilot, which is a field trial, very similar to what we did with body-worn cameras. This is our opportunity to understand the quality of the hardware and the software that we're gonna be buying. We wanna see it deployed in the field and understand how it compares, how one vendor's offer compares to another. So that pilot process for you all is a process of understanding certain aspects of the program itself, for the procurement process, it's really a field trial that allows us to engage in comparative analysis of one vendor's offer versus the other. Because we're not at the point of making an award, we're not allowed, I'm not allowed legally by the procurement code and the regulations to disclose who the offers um, from whom we have received offers. So let me say it like that. As in terms of the evaluation committee, I don't disclose who the evaluation committee members are either. And that is because we don't want folks who are either vendors or other affected parties reaching out to those people, making an effort to influence their recommendation to me as it relates to an award. So that's not information that we would make public either. Now we do upon request uh, provide some of that information post-award, but the ultimate goal for us is to protect the integrity of the procurement process. And disclosing certain pieces of information really run a file of that goal. And then your third question was, why wasn't somebody from the COB included? Um, at the end of the day, the award of any contract or the intent to award um, is made by the purchasing agent. The purchasing agent relies on different individuals with expertise uh, in that specific area to make the recommendation. We usually rely on the proponent department. So if we're buying instruments for the health department, for Dr. Wright, you know, we're gonna rely on him and his team to tell us who people are within their department or even within other affected departments um, to review the responses and then make some recommendations. They have to have an expertise in that area. Um, the information that we've received in terms of those recommended folks um, has not included anyone from the COB. And so I'm not uh, inserting myself at that level because it is really not a procurement issue at that point for me. If I get some instruction, some direction, some advice, uh, either from the administration, uh, from the police department or whomever, that that perspective is an expert perspective that should be included in those evaluations, then it would absolutely be taken under consideration. Thank you. Um, I guess two things. First, is there a bar, a disbarment for any vendor who administers LPRs who have, you know, shared LPR data with ICE. So the procurement code uh, and the regulations define the conditions under which a vendor may be debarred um, as an ultimate you know, as a major uh, penalty and suspended on a more minor level. It's not specific to that particular instance or those situations, but it does define kind of uh, for debarment, uh, egregious behavior, non-performance, uh, all of those kinds of things. And so we would have to see that kind of behavior typically in the execution of a contract. From, from your perspective, I think what you're describing is something that would cause those vendors to either be non-responsive or non-responsible. And the procurement code is also very clear on the bar for determining someone to be non-responsive and non-responsible as well. Non-responsibility usually has to do with um, lack of 
you know, capacity to actually execute the contract in the manner in which Metro advertised its request. Uh, you bid on it, but you know you didn't have the financial resources, you didn't have the types of licensure, you committed fraud in terms of your response. All of those kinds of things can result in you, be de in you being determined non-responsible. Uh, Non-responsiveness really has to do more with the solicitation itself, what we asked for in the solicitation, and your failure to adequately provide um, a responsive offer related to what was advertised in the solicitation. Let me ask it this way, right? Currently, there could be an LPR vendor who has shared information in other cities with ICE that could apply for this contract. If they are not determined as non-responsive or non-responsible to the solicitation itself, and if they have not been previously suspended or debarred, then I am not allowed to prohibit their participation in the procurement process. Okay. Thank you. And then, so it would be MMPD that says these are the people that we would recommend to you to be on that selection committee for license plate readers. Normally, the proponent department, which in this case is MMPD, would make the recommendation. This has been a process that has been inclusive of input, not just from MMPD, but also from the administration, et cetera. So, you know, kind of do not take, I'm not being flippant at all, but back to my previous point, you know, if I had, you know, advice, instruction, et cetera, from the administration or from the police department, as to the inclusion of such, then of course I have to take that into consideration. Okay. Is it too late to add someone onto that group that would determine this contract? So this was a multi-step solicitation. It's what we call a best value solicitation because what we're doing in the previous steps or rounds is determining the quality of the responses that we've received as well as uh, the adequacy of those proposers that evaluation has already occurred. So the last step in the evaluation process at this point is if this body approves um, this, this program going forward, then we would solicit pricing from those vendors who have been determined um, best qualified. To add additional evaluation committee members at this point, I think really jeopardizes the process because you bring in a new perspective beyond this point. Thank you. My question's for MMPD, um, for Chief Drake. Why wasn't... Governor the Spilda, can I get the administration to address that previous question as sure. well? I think they got more to add to that. So uh, sure. I'm going to go to the administration and let them uh, follow up on... Uh, uh, the answer. Thank, thank you for the indulgence, Councilmember Sepulveda. Just on the, the concern about, let's say, one of the vendors was sharing information with ICE. One of the things that you will have in the contract, you have these in standard contracts already, but this one as well will say, you have to comply with federal, state, and the local ordinances. This specific ordinance specifically prohibits sharing information for immigration law enforcement in any capacity for any reason. And if a law enforcement agency from any other realm, federal, state, some other state, contacts you and asks you for any data, they first fill out a form that says the name of the agency, the name of the individual, the reason they're asking for that information, and then they sign a form that says they will comply with our requirements. And if they say, oh, we're using it for immigration enforcement, it's done. There is no provision or sharing. And if that vendor is sharing it, they are automatically terminated. Sure, but there are some LPR companies that went out of their way to share information with ICE that was not solicited by a government agency is, is my main point, right? If there is a specific request from ICE, then they have to comply. But for the companies that went out of their way to share that, that's my question. Are those companies being considered? We can't disbar them is what I'm being told. So my question is to Chief Drake, would you be open to adding the Community Oversight Board, a member of the Community Oversight, into the procurement process, even if it is this late in the game? 
So I'm not sure we can add ourselves, the community oversight board, to the procurement process. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not opposed to anyone being involved with this. I've not hidden anything at all. We've been transparent about every intention that we've had. And so if the procurement process allows for that and they want that, then I, I'm not opposed to anything. I just want to make sure that we're fair, uh, that we're transparent, and that we're doing the right thing. Uh, I haven't asked, uh, I haven't even talked to procurement. I'm not trying to force the issue either way. I want them to make their own decision, and I've stayed away from that too. I, I appreciate that, Chief Drake. Um, what we're being told by procurement is that they take the recommendation of MMPD. So I, I, I guess I would ask you to have them included in that process. Um, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Councilmember Sepulveda. Uh, we've got Councilmember Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to verify, we've been told we've got two more passes at, at voting on something before anything is actually deployed. So when we get to the contract stage, we will vote on that, and at that point, we will have the information that's been asked about in terms of who the vendors are and what their backgrounds are. Is that correct? I'm seeing heads nodding yes. Okay, that, that seems relevant to me. I think all these questions are important, and there is an opportunity in the next contract to deal with that, so I'm not sure that we need to have that question answered here, knowing that we're going to have an opportunity when we can actually have that data as opposed to um, speculating about it. And then totally unrelated, well, somewhat related, can, can in that contract we ensure that the LPR data is retained only for the 10 days that we call for in our policy? I mean, is that, is that an autumn? I'm seeing heads nodding yes as well. So we spell out what our policy is and the contract ensures that they, they have to do that. And, and they are in breach of contract and, and, and breaking the law if they don't. Is that correct? Because that seems important to me as well. Um, and then a, just a, a, a question that I asked in the um, in the Q and A that I would I would like to have uh, spelled out again is we have gotten information on statistics and eighty arrests happened and cars were retrieved um, during this six month pilot. Can we get some information on how that compares with what was happening before we did the LPR pilot in those same areas? Is that a question is that a for Chief Gilder? administration? I'm going to summon uh, Chief Gilder and slowly answer that uh, with respect to uh, the vehicle theft apprehensions, if you look at the same six-month data from six months uh, from last year and then compare it to the six-month trial period, the uh, arrests increased by 43% uh, on that field. And I'll turn it over to Chief Gilder. Chief Gilder? He stole my thunder. Oh. <laughs> he All stole right. my thunder. That's essentially what I was going to report. I'm, did you have another question in addition to that? I'm so, I mean, does that, does that indicate then that that adding this technology has enabled you to to I, I, apprehend 80, 40 percent more than what you what you were doing the the old fashioned way with the with the officers sitting and typing it into a laptop? Well, it's certainly uh, clearly our arrest are up over time period to time period. Um, and I think it goes without saying that um, it's clearly helped us pinpoint, locate, and apprehend, I think it was the total numbers, 112 individuals um, that were wanted uh, in relation to uh, hits. So, you know, can I say how many would we have encountered with an officer randomly driving down a street who happens to notice that car, who happens to run that tag. I can't give you a, a comparison, it, you know, I'd be speculating, but um, certainly the, the system worked and was a, and, and assisted us in, in locating those individuals. And I think one thing that is bears uh, reiterating is it gives us the opportunity to formulate a plan. Uh, one of the things that's extremely important to Chief Drake and the department is public safety, including the, the, the risk that may be posed to the public when trying to apprehend someone. The last thing we want to do is get in a high-speed pursuit. And um, that's typically what happens when an officer gets behind a car, runs the tag, realizes it's stolen, attempts to stop it. It's almost always going to run. This gave us an opportunity to establish a plan, get assets, assets together like aviation. And in fact, a lot of those folks were taken into custody without traffic stops. They were followed till they were stopped. And then officers moved in, safely took that person into custody without the need for a pursuit. Okay. So thank you for that comparison between before and after. I, I think that's relevant information. And that's actual data as opposed to speculation about something that has happened three years ago in another 
city that, that we're concerned might happen here, but we've worked really hard to put guardrails to try to make those things not happen. So thanks for that information. Appreciate you making those points. Uh, Council Member Nash. This may be a question for our legal director uh, or the administration. I know we want to involve Mindy Oversight Board, but it is an oversight board. And I guess I would be concerned about a potential for conflict of interest if we have them sitting on the community groups, they make a decision, one of the board members is on there, they make a decision, then the, the oversight board says, that is not a good decision. Or we have them on the procurement board and all of a sudden a uh, decision is made by the procurement and then all of a sudden the oversight board decides, well, that wasn't really a good idea either when we've had the board involved. I, I, I think there's a potential conflict of interest there where they don't need to be in there. They are a review board after the fact, after the action, to give insight into what we might have done better or, or suggest a, a, an amendment to whatever happened. But to, to be on the boards directly is, I think, not a good idea. Uh, secondly, you know, we one of the first lessons in Criminal Justice 101 is that people commit the crimes to which they have access. The Metropolitan Police Department, all street level police departments are addressing street level crimes, primarily committed by those that don't have, are, are poor. We go out and steal car, we, we rob, we shoot somebody maybe over turf battle, um, we, we carjack, hijack, and primarily done by people of poverty. And that's what uh, the oversight board's demonstration shows. But I guarantee you without LPRs, you look at the arrests, and your percentages are gonna be about the same and that people and minorities are overrepresented amongst the poor too. But those are also important though, is the majority of the, a disproportionate number of the victims are also poor and people of color and they deserve justice. This gives them a better chance at seeing justice. We have a report here from Verna Wyatt who has been a victim's advocate for years, strongly supporting LPRs. So I, I, I hope we will not get lost in the fog of this. I think we're overdoing what the oversight board was meant to do. And I think you put them in a difficult position with some of the discussions we've had here tonight. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Uh, Council Member Rosenberg, I had your hand up. Uh, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a few questions. I'm not sure. Um, just about numbers from the pilot program, if I could, please. Um, first, there were, I think, about 71 million license plate hits. Um, there were 70 something stops. Is that right? Would you like that? Uh, Whoever. Police Department. I don't know if Commander Gilbert. Gilbert. Thank you. And hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Dylan DePriest. I was the data. Can we get the, can, oh. can we get the uh, police department here? And I will give you an opportunity to speak uh, following that. I don't want to exclude you. So the 71 million number is reads. Right. 71 million reads. Okay. And 71, 73. It, yeah. But what is the number of. You're asking for the I'm number asking of how many stops. stops. Yes. So on the website, it's somewhere, whatever was on the website. I can't, I, can't I can't remember the numbers on the website. If you remember in the subcommittee, two other subcommittee meetings, I told you we had a problem with the dashboard and trying to collect the data. Whatever the third report is, that's for each of those periods individually. I have not totaled those, those times up or stops. Okay. What's the 70 something number? The 71 million? No, seven, like literally 71, 72, 73. Was that arrests or searches? So the, arrest, or? the rest stopped at seven, uh, excuse me, at 112. So anytime okay. you arrest somebody, there's a search instant to arrest, right? Okay. There's two citations issued. You don't arrest on those, so there's no searches on those. Okay. And those 112 arrests came from how many stops? How many stops? Sometimes they did not stop arrests. a car. Sometimes they followed the car to a location. They waited for uh, they waited for the person to get out of the car, and they took him into custody. How many interactions? Well, there will be 112 interactions then. You so had to a car with three people in it. I, I can't. Yeah. So sometimes you had 18. I see what you're saying. You had 18 cases where there were more than one person arrested. Okay. 
Can you say how many of those were the result of fixed LPRs and how many were the result of mobile LPRs? I can say that majority of them were fixed over mobile. Okay. And what is considered a, a, an arrest at the result of an LPR? Like what, const, what does that constitute? Does that mean that the, uh, the contact with the individual was made a certain amount of time after the LPR read? It, it depends. You still got to find the car. Once it hits, then you got to find the car. So does that number include an instance where a car happens to hit an LPR on Sunday and then there happens to be a contact the next Saturday where you end no, up making an arrest? No, because you would still, even an officer, even if it's 30 minutes later, 15 minutes later, an officer gets behind that car, they're going to run that tag again to double check. They're just not going to pull it over without double checking the car and NCIC. What I'm asking is that can you directly attribute every one of those arrests to the LPR read or did some arrests happen after an LPR read? My apologies. No, I can contribute to the LPR. Again. Okay. So those are all made pretty much immediately after within a number of minutes and not days after the LPR no, read. I don't, I don't think there's days at all. No. Okay. I'd go back and double check, but I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenberg, you have any questions for the COB? I know the COB representative wanted to. Do you have any questions for them? Uh, if they have any data that has a, is relevant to that, I'm happy to hear it. Yes. So hello again. Sure. Uh, my name is Dylan DePriest. I'm the data analyst from the COB. I spoke at the last session. So if you all flip to your uh, reports on page four, it'll have a table outlining the vehicle stops, driver and vehicle searches, arrests, and vehicle recoveries. Uh, and it'll also have subsections by quadrant. So the 79 number, there were 79 vehicle stops, 70 driver or vehicle searches, 63 arrests, and 80 vehicle recoveries. And this was from MMPD's data dashboard. So I'm not exactly sure where the 119 number from MMPD's presentation last session or the 112 number uh, from this session came from, but at least on the publicly available data dashboard, it was 63, excuse me, 63. Thank you. Um, and MNP, do you want to respond to the question about the 119 number? Yeah, so we had, throughout this process, there were council reports that were required. Uh, Chief Blair and I attended those uh, council reports. At the beginning of the process, our goal was to establish a data dashboard, much like we do with other things. Uh, during those council reports, we communicated to the Public uh, Health and Safety Committee that the data dashboard information wasn't tabulating correctly as we had hoped, because again, we're in the midst of a procurement process and we're using multiple vendors and there was just not a way to automate that process. So what we ended up having to do was to hand tabulate that data and we produced, put that data in those reports that were published to council and that were also published publicly on our website at the same time. That's the correct counts. Unfortunately, the data dashboard did not function as intended. Thank you for that. Councilman Rosenberg, you got any further follow-up? No. Okay. Any other questions on the resolution as amended? Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Chair. I guess um, my final question um, is back kind of on the, on the fiscal side of the house. Um, looking back at the ordinance that was uh, uh, passed uh, by this body in December, setting the pilot program uh, in motion, um, I wanted to ask, um, I guess either Director Darby or the administration. So I'm, I'm reading um, section D um, and it says the approval by the Metropolitan Council for any action set forth in subsection 130880C, so that above, right, talking about the pilot program, shall be granted only upon the determination that the benefits to the citizens and residents of Nashville and Davidson County outweigh the cost. That the proposal will safeguard civil liberties and civil rights, and that, um, uh, in the judgment of the Metropolitan Council, no alternative with a lesser economic cost or impact upon civil rights and civil liberties would be as effective. And I guess what I want to understand is 
what is the document or the analysis that provides the cost benefit analysis? So we have the reports that we've received that were just referred to, but how are we formalizing um, the determination that the benefits to the citizens and the residents of this county outweigh the costs? Is that a question for the administration or the chief? You know, I, I think I think it's first for Ms. Ms. Dar <laughs> Darby. Yeah. I, I um, again, I think, you know, I'm looking at this now and thinking this is fairly imprecise uh, language. I appreciate that we've required reports and updates, but are we just taking the department at their word on this cost benefit analysis because as to my earlier questions, Chair, we don't know the cost, so we're not even speculating as to the cost. And so then how can we weigh the cost and the benefits as the ordinance requires us to do before we advance this resolution? Ms. Darby, you wanna take that question? I, I need to read what- She's um, doing a little research here before she answers. I'd, I'd welcome the administration to respond Thank as you. well in the meantime. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. So uh, I don't have the section pulled up in front of me, but the uh, the contract that will come before you uh, is under that section that specifically requires that it comes back to the council and also requires the public hearing before that. I believe that's the opportunity to weigh those three requirements that are required. I do believe that the, the December legislation does make those recitals, uh, those three provisions in the recitals clauses. Uh, in my humble opinion, I think that your those elements are really gonna come before this council when the vendor contracts are before you for approval. And having just uh, read the section that you referred to in here, um, it does make reference back to uh, part C of the um, the LPR ordinance or the surveillance ordinance, and and C does directly talk about the acquisition or the installation of the of, of the of the technology. Um, what is before you tonight with the resolution is actually required under part G. This is not the acquisition of the technology. This isn't the execution of an agreement for the technology, for the um, installation of the technology. This is a resolution that um, under subpart G of the, uh, the ordinance, um, just requires that you approve the program, the full implementation of the program going forward. Uh, and then, as Mr. Jamison has explained, and um, I think is referenced in the amendments, the uh, any contracts that are um, offered will have to come back to the council for approval. And at those times, we will also have to have um, a public hearing on the matter. So then, Ms. Darby, is kind of an order of operations then at that juncture, Again, I guess kind of cart horse. Um, the procurement is being um, uh, select, or we're we're making the procurement, or we're selecting it, as um, Ms. Hernandez Lane said. Um, I apologize. She referred to a best value solicitation, and then the next step being a. Um, can't remember the, the language for this next step, but that's determined by uh, the committee or, or you know the, the folks that are selected from a procurement standpoint. Um, and then I guess what transparency will there be then subsequent to that process to arrive at this required cost benefit analysis, because at that juncture, if, if the department is saying they don't know how many cameras will be needed or over time it can be grown, um, if it's found to be ineffective, et cetera, et cetera, I guess it, from your perspective, and I guess Mr. Jamison is sharing, he thinks it is sufficient to make the cost benefit analysis 
per the previously passed ordinance when the final ex acceptance of the contract is before us. Is that what you're asserting? Yes, I think that's the way the, the LPR ordinance is written, that once the, um, before any of those actions to acquire, to install, to, uh, I think even to expand the installation, um, the in order for you to approve the execution of those contracts, you would need to make that determination that the cost, uh, that the benefits outweigh the cost. Um, and uh, that the proposal safeguards against, um, you know, or safeguards civil liberties and civil rights, and uh, that in the judgment of the council that there's no alternative with a lesser economic cost or impact on civil rights or civil liberties available. So at that time, uh, once the, uh, the procurement is concluded and the agreement is um, offered up to the council, then you would make those determinations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. Any more discussion on the resolution as amended? Seeing none, all transportation committees in favor, raise your hand. Anybody opposed? Did you get all those? All right. Anybody opposed, raise your hand. Councilmember Henderson. Any abstentions? All right, we recommend approval. I do not have any more agenda items. I'm sure Councilmember Syracuse is anxious to get his public safety meeting underway. So thank you all. We are effectively adjourned.